Welcome to Live from the Internet with your host, Ezra Firestone. And featuring The Hot Seat with David Wood. Buying stuff and talking about it. Harry's versus Dollar Shave Club. This just in, bringing you the latest in marketing news. And now, let's get ready to rumble! Because we're live from the internet. Hey, I'm Ezra Firestone, and welcome to Live from the Internet, a new online show where we talk about business stuff, personal stuff, and other stuff, and where sometimes we show funny clips like this. We've got a really fun show for you today. We've got e-commerce news where I'm going to give you the scoop on Shopify cutting out third-party checkouts on the Chinese Amazon sellers and the big problem or big profit therein, and on Casper Mattress losing gobs of money and the D2C community's reaction to it. We've also got a new segment of buying stuff and talking about it, where we break down the marketing strategies of top e-commerce brands. In this episode, we've got two heavyweights, Harry's Razors versus Dollar Shave Club, two undisputed champs of men's grooming going head to head to see who can walk away with the belt. And we've got some other fun stuff. I'll give some e-commerce tips. I'll go on a rant or two. All that and more in this episode of Live from the Internet. A lot's been happening in the world of e-commerce and I have a lot to say about it. So let's jump right in to this segment called This Just In. Shopify, the big dogs in the game of e-commerce, cuts out third-party checkouts. No! This is huge. This is a long time coming. This is terrifying for people who've spent years and hundreds of thousands of dollars developing third-party checkout systems. What that means is, in fact, I am one of these people, by the way, what it means is you can no longer have a website and have a product for sale, collect payment for that product, and then send that back into Shopify. So essentially, you can't use Shopify without using their checkout. Shopify has something called Shop Pay, and it is their checkout system. It's got, it's got tokenization and vaulting, which means if you buy something from any Shopify store, your information, your credit card data, can be saved and reused later with just a text message on your phone. You go to a store, you go to buy, you click shop pay, and then it sends you a text message. Do you wanna buy this? You enter the code yes, and then it buys it. No credit card, nothing. You don't need to worry about taking out any information, putting in any credit card data. And Shopify is sick and tired, frankly, as I understand it, of people circumventing their checkout. And the reason they feel this way, I'm on the other side of this coin, by the way, and I'm gonna explain to you my viewpoint as a third-party checkout developer, but the reason they feel this way is because you know, Shopify cares a lot about the customer experience. And when you have people going through Shopify stores and then going to checkout, and then the checkout not looking or feeling or being the same as every other Shopify store, in a way, it devalues Shopify's product because people are having this experience with maybe a less than, uh, than wonderful or less than functional checkout, and they're relating that back to Shopify. That's one reason. Second reason is Shopify makes money on transaction fees. It is in their best interest of their business model to have people going through their checkout because that's how they charge percentages on top of the credit card processing and stuff like that. Of course, they still have Apple Pay, Amazon Pay, Google Pay, these kinds of things, but they're natively built into the Shopify checkout. And so, you know, from Shopify's point of view, when you circumvent their checkout, you are um, diminishing the experience for the user and you're also, um, you know, taking money out of their pocket in a way. Now, they have let this happen for years. For I've been I started developing a third-party checkout uh, in 2014, end of 2014. I've been doing it until now. So don't wait, try one click upsell. And the reason is Shopify's checkout as amazing as it is doesn't have certain functionality. I never wanted to develop checkout. Developing checkout is intense. It takes a lot of time. You have to spend money. There's all kinds of security risks. Are you kidding me? Look at all this crap. It's like a million wires in here. But I wanted to extend the functionality and, um, you know, be able to offer things like post-purchase one-click upsells. Shopify has come out and said, no, 
no more of that. And they actually shut a few providers down. Luckily, I have worked really hard to, I'm team Shopify all day, every day. My whole career is built on the back end of Shopify. I've been a fan, a follower, a collaborator, a partner. I'm the number six affiliate all time for Shopify, which means I'm in the top six in the world who've gotten people to go sign up for Shopify. I'm a big supporter. And so I've been saying to Shopify for years, listen, build me in. I don't want to develop my own checkout. I want to natively integrate with you. I want an API so I can talk to your checkout and extend it with front end direct response functionality and not have to worry about developing checkout on my own. I have a deal with them where I'm allowed to operate in the interim and then eventually I will be natively built in, which has my, been my goal all along. But Shopify, uh, you know, they're getting a lot of flack for this, for, for getting rid of these third party partners. But it, you know, it really makes sense in the long run of their business model. I totally understand it. And I'm not upset. Perfectly calm, dude. Because it's been a gray area, as evidenced by they don't let third-party checkout apps inside of their app store. So they've been anti-third-party checkout for a while, in a way. And so it's been a gray area. The writing has been on a wall. This has been coming for a long time. And I say, hey, you know, they're the big dogs. And don't bite the hand that feeds you. And play by the rules. And look to collaborate, not uh, agitate and battle. And so what are you going to do? I'm on board. Shopify all day. If you're a retailer on Amazon, you know how crazy it is having people counterfeit your products, having people in China uh, take over your listing and drop ship the products that you're selling directly from China. It's a really big problem for American sellers, Chinese counterfeits, and it's a problem on Amazon, Chinese counterfeiting. Now, of course, there's a bunch of incredible, real, uh, authentic sellers with integrity in China as well. But now, as of the last filing, 49% of the top 100,000 retailers on Amazon are based in China. That's up from 38% a year ago. That's a 13% year over year growth, which is super intense. <sighs> which means that in China, more and more people who have factories who are making products are going direct to Amazon and selling them there, cutting out the middleman, cutting out people who are coming direct to their factory and also recreating the products that their factories are selling to third-party sellers themselves. So it's getting harder and harder. If you're manufacturing in China a product that is not that you don't have any intellectual property ownership of, or that's maybe a Me Too product, maybe you're drop shipping from China, that's a tough business model. And I think this is indicative of the Amazon business model in general, which is go rank something on Amazon and try to sell it. It's not really for branded story-based products that are mission-driven and purpose-driven. It's like Amazon is cash flow. It's a tough model and it's a cash flow model and you're not really building an asset that is valuable to you in the long term as valuable as a brand that has a story behind it where you're advertising it yourself or you're selling it on your own store. And I think what this signals is number one, Chinese retailers are getting smarter and smarter and they're selling more and more on Amazon, which makes it more difficult for American and European sellers. And also it signals that you should be thinking if you're Amazon only, which I know a lot of you are, about branded e-commerce where you're creating videos and you're telling stories and you've got, um, you have some product intellectual property that is not just you're white labeling someone else's stuff, but maybe you've actually invested in making the product better in some way, invested in manufacturing, invested in making a product that you can tell a story about that has some unique sales propositions or some unique value beyond just what's already in the market. Casper Mattress, the not so friendly ghost. If you're an investor, your investment is a ghost. It's good that Casper got hit today, except for the people from Casper. Casper filed for uh, an IPO and their projected valuation was gonna be a billion dollars. And everybody was so excited about it. And then their books came out and it turned out that on 312 million in revenue in the last 12 months, they had lost $67 million. Damn! And I think this is like indicative of what we will continue to see from these big giant brands. Another one is called Brandless. They just came out that they're going bankrupt. Okay, well the direct to consumer goods company Brandless is going out of business. All these big direct-to-consumer companies that were backed by private equity and venture capital that you saw all over Instagram stories that thought they could just buy their way into the game are learning that 
The game is about a lot more than just throwing money at it. You can't just throw money at a brand and have it work. You've got to have good products. You've got to focus on profitability. You've got to engage with your customers and add value to their life beyond just selling them a product. And you've got to launch products. And I think that like we're going to continue to see this in the D2C space, these big giant venture-backed companies that are focused on Instagram story, carousel ads, and YouTube ads that are just throwing money at the wall trying to force their business to work. You're going to see more and more of them going in this direction. And that's really, really good for us small guys because it opens up inventory, right? These big companies who are putting all these bets into the auction are making it more expensive for us. But once they realize that in order to play the game, that at some point you gotta be playing on profitability, it's better for us small guys. So I say, hey, what are you gonna do? It's gonna happen and they should have known better is my viewpoint. And I think that, you know, it's good for small guys like us. I don't like to see anybody uh, fail in business. I don't like to see anybody lose money. I don't like to see any investors not make it. But I also have been seeing the ad markets, the cost of ads going up and, and, and the auction be flooded with these big venture backed companies that are just smashing ads down people's throats and rising costs for all of us. And I thought, how can they be profitable? And what we f are finding out is that they're not. And so I think it is um, really a good sign for folks who are um, really taking the time to focus on good product, good storytelling, and good advertising. So it's a bummer for Casper investors, but it's a good uh, sign of the times to come for direct-to-consumer, which is focus on profitability. Hey, welcome to another episode of Buying Stuff and Talking About It, where I break down the marketing behind the biggest e-commerce brands in the world. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about one of the most famous e-commerce brands ever, Dollar Shave Club, and their biggest rival, Harry's Razors. I'm going to break down their product, their packaging, their emails, their ads, their websites. Plus, we're giving away a shave set to three lucky winners, so stick around for how to enter the drawing. Okay, here we go. Harry's versus Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club burst onto the scene in 2012 with their now famous viral video. Then in 2015, they were bought by Unilever for a billion dollars. Harry's is their main competitor with modern design, transparent practices, and a progressive message. In terms of business models, both of them are direct-to-consumer subscription. You buy the handle, and then every month or so you get a pack of razors, and they want to upsell you on soaps and toothbrushes, even butt wipes. As a customer acquisition strategy, both of them use a tripwire, which is a term that digital marketer popularized a few years back, which is essentially a low-priced front-end offer to get you in the door and then transition you into a full price subscription. And to give you a sense of their rivalry, both of these brands have published blog posts about why they are better than the other. With Dollar Shave Club focusing on quality of shave and Harry's focusing on design, price, and company values. But my question is, who has the better marketing? So this is the first ad. I wanna point out that they're doing some really good stuff. They're saying, hey, get $15 worth of shaving supplies for just $5. So they're making a value proposition that you're gonna get more than you pay for. They're using emojis as bullet points. And they're saying, hey, you know, you're getting amazing products. We're world famous. We've got this world famous product. They're talking about the benefits of the product. And then they've got a big giant four by five ratio video, which is gonna take up a lot of real estate on mobile. And they're doing what I've done, which is editing a headline right into the video. So above the video, as you're watching it, there's a big headline that says, I don't really like shaving at all. And it, then it's this guy going through a shave routine. It's real native. It looks real. It looks authentic, but they're, they're doing a really good job with this video ad. Here's another ad that they do. Notice the same formula, emojis as bullets. They're using ownership benefit statements, value propositions, value claims. They're saying, hey, you can get a starter set for just $5. And then they're saying, hey, do you hate shaving? You might need this. Again, that four by five ratio video with the text edited in. And then here's another kind of fun one. Another thing, same exact copy from the first ad we looked at, but a different video. In this case, they don't have text edited in, but they're saying, hey, girl razors are too expensive. 
don't pay more for pink. So they're, uh, they're going out to women and they're saying, hey, you're being sold razors that are pink and fancy, but you don't need those. You can use these amazing razors and you can get them cheaper. So they're, they're appealing to women here, which I like. They're going both men and women doing a really good job with their mobile. Most of uh, Facebook's ad uh, inventory is mobile. About 90% of Facebook's ad revenue comes from mobile. So all their videos are in a mobile format, a four by five ratio. Really, really beautiful job by Dollar Shave Club with these videos. I would have probably had links above the videos so that you didn't have to click below the video. I always include a text link, uh, HTML hyperlink, blue underline link above my videos in the first couple lines of copy so that someone can click above the video as well as below. But otherwise, these, these video ads are amazing. All right, now let's look at some of Harry's top of funnel advertisements. Okay, here we have Harry's with a big giant 16 by nine image ad opening with an emoji saying, should a pack of razors cost $32? We don't think it should. Enjoy smooth, comfortable shave with Harry's. Your face and your wallet will thank you. Just eight bucks to get started. And they've got that hyperlink above the ad uh, so you don't have to click below. And then they say, try our best selling starter kit today. Get a handle and choice of your color and a five blade cartridge. So they're really playing to price. They're saying, hey, razors are overpriced. And you know, and their, their razors are on a sheepskin, which I think is kind of interesting, but it's a fairly compelling image. And they're saying, hey, you're paying too much for razors. Very simple value proposition, all about price. Second ad, this is in that uh, four by five ratio for mobile. And they're basically just saying, hey, we, we charge honest prices. We're gonna be cheaper. They've got a nice colored backdrop, text overlay. They're saying join over 5 million guys who've tried Harry. So they're using social proof and they're making a play on price. And then this is actually just a carousel of images with no text above it. And it says, join over 5 million guys that have tried Harry's bonus. You get your free shipping on starter set. So it's just a carousel of their products. And they're saying, Hey, a bunch of people use us. We've got some social proof here going on. There's a fun emoji and these are our products. Okay. Right away. I see one huge difference. Harry's is not using any top of funnel video ads. Oh, come on! That is a big, big no-no in today's world. The best way to build relationship and engagement and, and uh, uh, community and sell is via video. Tone, cadence, you can feel it, you can see it, you can hear it. It's so much better than image ads and GIF ads. Not to mention, you're gonna miss out on, let's say 65 plus percent of the inventory that you could get if you're not running video ads. So that's really, really bad that they're not doing. I mean, images are great, GIFs are great, and those should supplement a good video ad strategy for your top of funnel. All right, I gotta stop everything and give Harry's a buzz because that's just no good. That's just not good. You gotta have video at the top of the funnel, but format aside, let's take an in-depth look at what these ads are actually doing. I love the testimonial in Dollar Shave's ad. It shows the razor in action and the user enjoying the experience. It's using social proof to develop a pain point and then solve it. And the copy is also super easy to read and it lays out the offer really well. On the other hand, I like how Harry's captures their brand aesthetic and the beauty of their products. But here's my issue. Harry's copy doesn't even apply to their offer. What the hell are you talking about? They ask, should an eight pack of razors really cost $32? But what they're giving you isn't an eight pack of razors. In fact, looking at what the ad says, it says $8 gets you started, but you don't know with what. I'm gonna have to buzz them again for that. They just have so much they could say about their brand and their product and their story, but instead they just show you an image of the product with some misleading copy. It looks more like a retargeting ad, which is what we're looking at next. But first let's settle up with some points. I gotta give the first point to Dollar Shave Club for you guessed it, using top of funnel video. Another point to Dollar Shave Club for using a testimonial to establish a problem and offer a solution, which is one of my favorite things to do in ad copy. And another point to Dollar Shave Club for using their copy to really clearly lay out the offer. Beautiful ads by Dollar Shave Club. That's three points for them. For Harry's, I'll give them one point for aesthetic. But that's it. They showcase their brand aesthetic, but they have really missed the boat on their top of funnel advertising by not using video, by not having great copy. I mean, they just are not doing well there. I got to give them one point for the aesthetic of the product, but that's it. So that brings our current total in round two to three points, Dollar Shave Club, one point, 
Harry's. Let's continue round two with the retargeting pillar of advertising, which is getting your message back in front of people once they've engaged with you once. They've seen an ad, they've visited your site, they've engaged on some level, and now we're trying to bring them back in and sell them. Let's talk about retargeting for Harry's First Dollar Shave Club. Welcome to What's Working Now, where I share with you what's working in my eight-figure e-commerce business. I currently run a, a physical product, direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand. We do a couple million dollars in revenue per month. We're driven by paid ads and content marketing and sales and emails and all kinds of fun stuff. And I also run a company called Smart Marketer, which is what you're engaging with now, where we do we publish information about what's working in our businesses and I run Zipify Apps, which is a Shopify store, uh, Shopify app development company that helps people who have Shopify stores, you know, perform better with those stores, have those stores make them more money, make them more sales, make it easier for their customers to shop. And today, I'm gonna to be sharing with you an example from my e-commerce business. This is working so well for me right now. And I believe that like one of the most important parts of your business is how you are getting people's attention. The advertisements, the videos, the images that you're putting in front of them to get them to know about you. And so there's a formula that I developed late last year, kind of the June or July of 2019, called Love Demo Love. You've heard me talk about it before. I'm gonna give you a refresher on it, and then I'm gonna share with you what's working for us January, February of 2020. I'm filming this February some odd of 2020, and uh, I'm gonna share with you what's happened in January and February, how this formula has evolved. So this is a video advertisement formula that works across the spectrum of businesses, whether you're selling e-commerce, information, coaching, consulting, services, software. This video ad formula works. I'm using it in all those places, and my mastermind members of my Blue Ribbon Mastermind are also using it. So I have spent millions of dollars on this particular ad formula of getting people to know about my brand, putting it in front of people who don't know about me, and telling them, hey, this is who I am and this is what I have to offer and having them want to buy from me. That's the whole point of an ad, right? Get someone to know who you are, get them to understand the problem that your product solves and get them to want to buy from you. So let's quickly take a look at the computer here. I'll go through the formula, then I'll come back and talk to you a little bit about the update we've made and then I'll show you our ads that are running right now. So the way this video formula works is it starts with love, which is a face-to-camera customer testimonial or multiple face-to-camera customer testimonials. In my case, I do three or four women face-to-camera, 10 seconds a pop, talking about the benefit of, the, of my product, why they use my product, why they like it, what it's done for them, how it's changed their life. And then I go into a demonstration of the product in use. So I start with love. Then I do a demo. I don't start with a product demo. I start with someone, you know, coming out with an enthusiastic, um, you know, compelling testimonial essentially of my product and what it's done for them. Then I demonstrate the product in use. And then I end with more love, more face to camera customer testimonials where people are talking about the value of the use of the product. The, the key about ads is you must demonstrate something called ownership benefit. That's the number one thing you want to demonstrate is what is the benefit of owning this product in your ad? You'll notice here that we have women of all different age range. You got to make sure that the people who are representing your product in advertisements look like the people that you're selling to. And what we found is that there was a little bit of reverse ageism going on because we sell to women over 50. Turns out women in their 60s don't want to hear about the experience of aging or beauty or cosmetics from women in their 40s, right? So if you look back at the screen here at some of these ads, you'll notice that we've got women in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, etc., and we're running those to the particular age ranges. I want to point out that we are doing square videos, but notice that the video is still a 16 by 9 or rectangle ratio, but we have edited in our own headline above the video in the video canvas and we've edited in our own very big easy to read captions and we find that this gets us more screen real estate on mobile as well as makes it easier to read the captions because 87 percent of videos are played on facebook without audio uh, and it works way better because we get an additional headline we don't just have copy 
in the text above the video unit on the Facebook ad, we actually have text in the video itself. Uh, notice that we also have a call to action down below. That is what we call an ownership benefit statement, a makeup bag in three little sticks. That's the benefit of owning the product, as well as some sales copy above. We're using a very specific sales copy formula here. Uh, let me show that to you. We're using social proof, a customer testimonial as the first thing in our ad. It's not us saying we're awesome. It's a customer saying that we are awesome. That's social proof. Then we have an ownership benefit statement. These simple sheer cosmetic sticks give every woman the look of happiness, joy, and vitality, all with a five minute application. So we're saying, hey, look, you're gonna get the look of being happy, of, of being joyful, of being vital, and it's gonna be fast. That's an ownership benefit statement, but we don't start with that. We start with social proof. Then we've got the additional headline edited in, the mobile video square canvas, the edited in captions, and some ownership benefit copy down at the bottom. That's one of our best ad formulas. So notice I'll play a couple of these for you just to show you a uh, uh, you know, reminder of this love demo love formula. Let's, let's take a look at one of these ads that's working really well for us. I use the glow glimmer and the color and it's beautiful. They just um, go on very easy. You can, you know, I change them. One can be um, the lipstick and then the eyeshadow and then on the cheeks. It's great. I so she starts with the, the name of the product and how she uses them and how they're wonderful, what they do for her and how much she likes it. And then I, I didn't play this properly. I use the glow glimmer. Great. I've been using the Boom products already for three years. Transitions into another woman and then another woman and then it goes into a product demo and then has more women at the end. Let me show you, uh, I'm going to play it fast, a uh, full screen of this where I'm, I'm skipping through it. I bought the sticks. It's one woman, in this case, we're doing one, one woman only, then we've got our demo, and then we've got another woman at the end. So we're just doing one and one. You don't necessarily need more than one person demonstrating your product, talking about the value of it at the beginning or at the end. It's kind of fun to have multiple, but you can try both. This is why creative iteration is the most important thing you could do in today's advertising game. So what's working well for me, the, this is the best my ads have ever performed. I'm 10 years into my business. It's a 10 year anniversary of Boom this year. And I'm having my best advertising year ever. When everybody else is complaining about rising costs and everybody else is complaining about they can't get ads to work. Love Demo Love, it's working for all my students. It's working for me. And what I'm doing is I'm iterating and I'm creating and I'm getting more assets and I'm testing short form and long form and I'm supplementing with GIF animations. I'm supplementing with images. So. I created a mini course called How to Run an Ambassador Program. I created it with my, my social media director, Laura Palladino, talks to you about how we're actually getting people to give th these assets to us, exactly what we're doing to get these assets, which I think are the most important assets that you could possibly ever create for your brand, uh, how we're getting them. And it walks you step by step. If you're interested in that, comment under this video ambassador program or I want your ambassador program or I want to buy that course. It's a very affordable. I'll send you a little video that breaks down what it is and you have the opportunity to purchase that course really in depth, super affordable, good price. And frankly, I think one of the best things we've ever created in terms of a course that teaches you one individual strategy that can change your business. So comment under this video, say, I want your ambassador program course. I'll send you a link to a, it's not even out yet. I'll send you a link to a backdoor page where you can get it at a discount. You'll be one of the first people to get access to it. You'll get it at a 30% discount from what we're actually going to sell it for. And you'll be first to market to create these incredible ambassador program videos. You don't need our course. It's really, really amazing. It'll teach you exactly how we're doing. It'll give you our templates. It'll give you our contracts. It'll give you our communications. It'll give you everything we're doing, but you could just go ahead and do this on your own if you want and copy this strategy, or you could, you know, train deeper with us. Either way is good. My name is Ezra Firestone. This has been What's Working Now. Thanks for watching. Welcome to another episode of How I See It. This segment is all about how I perceive life, how I look at life, my frame, my lens for approaching business and life, which is alternative, which is not mainstream, which is counterculture, if you will. You know, it's a little bit different than how other people look at things. And it has really served me um, these alternative viewpoints that I hold and the way that I look at life. And this, this episode, this video is, a, is specifically for young men. And it's about how young men are looking at the world and what is motivating them. It's, it's external motivation versus internal motivation. It's really, really, really important to 
take a look at what are motiv- what's motivating your action and be deliberate about what's motivating your action and not have that just be on autopilot or just conditioned viewpoints that you've received from society that are motivating your action. So let's jump into internal motivation versus external motivation, mostly aimed at young men. Hey, young man, under 30 years old, to be specific, you know why your relationships are failing and you're not where you want to be? Because your attention is on yourself and your performance, not on enjoying whatever it is you're doing. You see, men are sold that their value in society. We are sold as men that our value comes from success, from the more money we make, the more we produce, which creates this environment of men posturing and peacocking and balling out on Instagram and wearing gold chains. And, and look, I'm all about having fancy stuff and enjoying, enjoying consumerism and enjoying having things, but not to impress other people, not to posture and look cool, but because you actually are enjoying whatever that thing is. I have a $2,000 skateboard I'm going to show you I, I, while we're at it. This skateboard is a, it's a booster board. It's, uh, it's like, you know, 1500 bucks or whatever it is. The point is I'm not against fancy things. I think I really, I get a lot of enjoyment out of this thing. I love this thing. I have it because it's a lot of fun to play with and to use, not because it makes me look cool in videos and I can show it off to other people. The thing that will serve you I'll get this out of the shot now. (laughs) The thing that will serve you as a man in society is to show up, be present, and enjoy what you're doing. Your sex life will be better. Your business life will be better. Your relationship life will be better. Everything in your life will improve if you stop having the focus of your life be to impress other people by uh, showing off how interesting you are. Because we're taught as men that interesting sells, interesting wins, be the most interesting person, uh, uh, you know, wear fancy stuff and tell cool stories. But you know what wins? Interested. Being interested in what you are doing, interested in the people around you, actually consumed with and enjoying the people around you and what you're up to, not approaching it with some goal in mind and trying to get somewhere and trying to show off. And man, this is a problem for so many men. They don't realize that their whole entire identity and uh, the way that they're presenting in the world has this backdrop, this 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 sort of veil of trying to is searching for approval, searching for uh, being you know approved of by their peers and recognized as awesome. And social media, the social media economy really plays into this, right? Because you see everyone's living their best life on social. This is me holding an iPhone. Um, And so you want to, you know, do something similar and show off. And it's like, man, that is a recipe for sadness and disaster. Frankly, if, if, if all of your actions are motivated by attempting to impress your peer group, specifically other men, I notice, right? It's all about impressing the other dudes. And it's like, no, a better way to go is to enjoy what you're doing and and have it be motivated by things that you actually desire. To check your motivations is really what what I'm getting at here. Why is it that you want the fancy stuff? Why is it that you want money? Why is it that you want success and, and fame and, you know, women and whatever, what, it, what, what is motivating you? What are, what is motivating those desires? Is it that you truly are interested in having access to resource that you can use to do things right? Like I am interested in, I'm very obviously very interested in wealth creation. I have a lot of people I want to take care of. I also enjoy having nice things and, and, you know, money buys you comfort, it does not buy you happiness. You got to really hear that young man. This is specifically for the young guys. I mean, I've been you, dude. I've been there. So money will buy you comfort, but it won't buy you happiness. And so you have to really understand and, and, and take inventory of what is motivating you to behave the way that you're behaving. And most likely, if you're like all the other young men out there, uh, it's to be accepted by your peer group, to uh, be seen as cool, to impress the opposite sex or whoever you're trying to impress, whatever it is. And so you know, you'll get further if you are motivated by something greater than vanity, frankly, that it, it's a more powerful, 
uh, force, the motivation to, uh, and look, pain is a great motivator. I mean, a lot of people are motivated by, they don't like their jobs. They're, they're doing something they're not interested in. Generally people who want to be entrepreneurs, which is probably you, if you're watching this is, uh, or who are entrepreneurs are motivated by, you know, desire for freedom of time, freedom of location, freedom of, of financials, et cetera. But like once you've made 75 grand a year, I think the study says you don't get any happier right? More money does not bring you any more happiness. What brings you happiness is having purpose, being fulfilled, having intimacy and connection with other people. And the way to go about a life that is pleasurable is to be interested in what you are doing, to find it right and enjoy it and enjoy the process of whatever it is, bettering your body, working out, working on your business, like do it from a place of joy, do it from a place of approving of it and actually enjoying it and being present with it. And I know all this sounds cliche, but it's like, it's super true. And the real message that I'm trying to get across to you is like, check your motivations. What is motivating you and be very clear and okay with whatever that motivation is. And look, if the motivation is to be accepted by your peer group, look, everyone, we are hurting animals. It's okay to want to be accepted by your peer group. But if that's your sole motivation is vanity and acceptance, it can be tough to get where you want to go, right? It's, it's nice to have a bigger goal than just people approving of you. Of course, we all want to be approved of and this and that, but you know what feels better than any outward approval is internal approval. If you approve of yourself and you find yourself and where you're at and your situation, right. And you're looking at it as good and trying to get better. That is really what you want because there's no amount of people telling you you're great. That is actually going to make you feel great if you don't believe it internally. So this whole, you know, this happens. I just see this with all the young men is like, they're motivated by a desire to make money, to impress their peer group because they are sold this viewpoint that their identity and their value in society is based around how much money they can make. And it's really could not be further from the truth. And you will end up potentially rich, but unhappy if you follow that path. And that's how I see it. Listen, you know, I'm a big fan of understanding why we are doing what we're doing and being um, responsible for our actions. I, myself personally, I want to understand what is motivating my actions and I want to be in agreement with those motivation. And frankly, I'm not even against vanity as a form of motivation. I think that's okay. That's a, an okay reason to be motivated. As long as you're aware that that's what's motivating you and you're being deliberate about that, right? Like I got a buddy, he's very motivated by how he looks. He wants to look good. A lot of people are motivated by how they look. It's not a wrong motivation, but it's good to be aware of the different things that are motivating us and understanding why we are being motivated by those things. So I hope that was helpful to you if you were a young man, or if you're not a young man, I hope that was helpful to you as well. Let's move on to the next segment. Welcome to the hot seat where I interview someone who's had an impact on my life or someone who I respect and admire about what's going on in their life or what's going on in their business. In this case, I'm interviewing the guy who got me into the game, the guy who taught me search engine optimization, the guy who gave me a job in 2004, 2005 and introduced me to internet marketing. Amazing guy. You'll hear all about our story, our relationship, what happened in this episode of The Hot Seat. And we are live with Mr. David Wood. I want to play the clip of, of that where you're in that green, like 1987 boxy blazer, just solid lime green. You're walking it's out on stage. Ball, it's, it's 2007 and Orlando at a, at some hard rock hotel, you walk out on stage in front of what? A thousand people. Well, I Orlando was a thousand. LA was 1200. Yeah. Okay. So we're in two, we're 2007. We're at, walking out on stage. The guy's going, David, woo. You've got the 19, you got the 2007 long side part going like full red Australian hair flapping no. as you talk. So David Wood um, is a, a life coach. Um, one of the OGs, original guys, which we should tell that story about how you got into coaching, but also my avenue in to e-commerce, internet marketing, SEO, just like the way that I got in this industry was through you. Um, so you were like my, you know, the deal that we made, I don't know if you remember this, but I was going to teach you poker and you were going to teach me search engine optimization, right? I actually ended up taking over one of your product, all the marketing and launches and sales funnels for, for solution box for a while there. You just took that stuff on 
because I could, I could give people a bunch of DVDs and they're never going to look at them. Sure. You studied that stuff. You took it on as your own. You started working on some of my products. You launched a whole product yourself, uh, the inner circle coaching. Yeah. yeah. You were creating videos and you just took to it like a duck to water. And, and you were there at my first big speech backing me up. Um, and one of the things you do is, and you teach is to serve the world unselfishly and profit. And man, you really served me. You helped me. You were like, David, you've got to eat. You've got to eat well. You've got to be taken care of. You've got to have all this stuff off your plate. You've got to perform on stage. You handled all the, the booth. You did all that stuff. We were making it happen. And I like to say that like what Smart Marketer is. So Smart Marketer, as you know, is the brand's putting out this video. This is just a 2018 model of what Solution Box was back then. It's the same model. And it's just evolved for, for the time. And I learned this whole model in a way from you. I got a bunch of cool stuff from James Schramko when I was with him for a while, like doing really intense uh, content marketing strategy. Um, but I mean, this, which you're now back to, we should talk about, right? So, so you ran this model for a while, which yeah. is creating content, yeah. engaging a group of subscribers, adding value to their life through content that's relevant to a specific conversation or topic, and then having courses, trainings, events, whatever, you know, masterminds that you uh, sell to support this operation. Yeah. 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 Okay. You bring me into the game. Uh, I come up under you. We're, we're running events. We're, we're doing, in, you know, an information publishing model for a couple years. Uh, we have this yeah. big idea to run uh, continuity, which was off your book launch. You know, you wrote a book, Get Paid for Who You Are, which we should probably link to. Um, good book. W where did things go? Let's talk about it. Yeah. Well, the book launch was, was a huge part of my life. I put 150 grand and you know, countless hours into making this thing be everything. And you know, I think one of the mistakes I made is not letting you run the launch. I felt that way. I still feel that way. I, you and I, we, I don't know if we've, we've never talked about this publicly, but there was like a little rift there between us for a while. In like, so from my view, I had been running marketing for Solution Box, all the product launches, all the webinars, writing the copy, doing the sales page, doing everything. And we were crushing it. We were doing really well. And I don't like to use the, I got to find something. Crushing it is so, why does everything have to be crushed? Like it's- We were, we were rocking it. We were yeah, rocking, we were rocking it. it, man. And it was super fun and, and whatever. Okay. Then you fly off to this event and you get sold high ticket product launch formula model launch. And, and by the way, we've been building up your, you've been writing your book. Like the business model was David Wood, the influencer and solution box and solution box products, right? Like you were part of the model, amplifying your voice, building you up as an influencer. You were, you had a list. How big was the list? It was 150,000 at the peak. And that, that for that time was pretty big to be a, it was like everyone into coaching in the world. You know? it, 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 I think it was the largest list of coaches and, and people who want to be coaches uh, yeah. at that time in the world. Yeah. Okay. So you, yeah. I, my experience of it is you go to some event, you get sold some package of like, Hey, you know, these people are the best people out there to run the product launch. Yeah. You're, you came back and you're like, Hey, these people are going to run this product launch. And I was devastated. I was like, really? I'm not running it. How is this? They don't know what's going on. They don't have context for this. So, and I was really young, but wow. we were also good think... enough friends that it was like, I was like, okay, if that's, we were good enough buddies that I was like, I'm going to put my ego aside and say, if this is what you think is in the best interest of the operation, dude, I'm on board. I did feel that I should have done it though. You know, I don't think I ever knew that you were devastated. So that's, you well, were maybe devastated is strong, a strong word. Disappointed, right. I think. Um, right. Yeah. I can totally get that. We talked about it. Well, well, I, yeah. And I, man, you know, I think that was probably a big mistake because, you know, I hired some people who'd done this and they'd done like really big launches and uh, paid them a bunch of money and the launch did not produce what I wanted it to do. Sure. So I imagine there, some of our listeners can relate to having huge expectations for something and it just like the server crashed. I know. And I paid a guy to reinforce the server. The server crashed. You had did some really innovative stuff though during that launch. Oh, and I, yeah. I don't know if it was a mistake, frankly, because ultimately I'm happy where I am. You're happy where you are. I think it was like the right, right. thing to happen. <laughs> However, I did get to do one thing on that launch, which was GPU. I was like, let's put an upsell for continuity on the back end of this book launch. 
get and paid university. get paid university, which ended up being where I cut my teeth as an educator. Because yeah. GPU, I ran those webinars twice a week for for years. Yeah, yeah, so, you you rocked it. They're still they're still on the web. They're still there. So so the server crashed. The thing didn't produce the the, the huge sales. It ended up making money over two or three years due to the continuity. So I you know I'll tell you I'll I'll do a reveal right here. I wept that damn. night. I was like just I just fell apart after all the pressure. And yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And I, I was devastated. Yeah. And lesson there, I think we'll just pull out a little lesson, a couple things that I've learned over the years is like, yeah. it's good to be emotionally invested in the projects. If you're not emotionally invested, mm -hmm. then you're not, you don't care enough. But right. to, to, so you should, so right on to be fully uh, like attached to the outcome, because when you're attached to an outcome, you really give it your all to set it up such that the entire operation rides on one thing, which in this case it didn't. I think you were just done. You'd just been going so hard for so long. Yeah. Um, I don't know that actually the whole, because for years it still produced, right? Even after, so. Yeah, yeah. So, it, but, it, it was profitable over the long term. Totally. And you can't put a price on the experience. I mean, that launch, I had levels upon levels of strategy. It was like, this is already good. And we're going to do this. And then we're doing this. And people couldn't even follow the seven. It was so it was fun. It was it good. Was fun. Hey, man, thanks so much for, for uh, coming on. Super fun to talk to you. And uh, check David Wood out, playforreal.life. Catch up with you later. Yeah, thanks, man. That was the hot seat with David Wood. If you're interested, that is just a short clip of it. We actually did a 40-minute interview. If you want the full interview, if you want me to release it, I'm not sure. There's some stuff in there. I was like, ah, let's just cut it down. I was a little embarrassed about parts of my history or about where we had some friction. So if you want that full interview, if you would watch it and it would be interesting to you, I will release it, but not unless you comment under this video and say, I want the full interview with Woody. I want the full interview with David Wood. I want to hear the whole story of what happened between you guys, how you got to here. Um, so if you want that, go ahead and comment and request it below. And if I get enough people interested, I will release it. If not, I'm going to just leave it in the archives for just my editing team who already saw it. So that was the hot seat with David Wood. Let's move on to the next segment. Welcome to another episode of that's a good question where I answer your questions about business, about life, about whatever you got going on, but anything you want to ask me, I will answer. Now, last episode, I asked some of you, do, do you have questions for me? And then some of you actually did. Wouldn't you know it? So I guess I gotta answer them. So here we go for this episode of That's a Good Question. First question comes in from big dog Sam Hewitt, who's asking, why don't I offer subscription or loyalty rewards programs for customer retention? So I don't offer subscription because my audience has protested it. So basically a lot of women over 50 have been caught on these subscription programs for things that they can't cancel. And they really, really, as a community, do not like subscription-based products. Subscription-based products work much better for Gen Y and the millennials. They don't work that well for Gen X, but Gen Y and the millennials really understand. They grew up with the internet. They understand subscription. They're happy to be subscribed. They understand how to log in and modify their subscription and edit it. My customers are not that tech savvy. They want to call in on the phone. They want to talk to somebody. And they really don't like the idea of subscription. I don't sell subscription, and I still get people calling in, making sure they're not subscribed. I have offered it on my offer page. I've offered it as upsells to try to test it. I don't get a high take rate. People don't like it. So there's just like this general sense of anti-subscriptionness, not a real word, but what the hell did you just say? Anti-subscriptionness to that my audience has, and I've tested it out. They don't really like it. So, so I don't do it, but even without subscription, I have a higher repeat customer rate than a lot of people who do have subscription because I don't think you need subscription to increase your lifetime customer value or have a high repeat customer rate. I think you need good content marketing, product launches, sale events, things like that, you know, giveaways, engagement content in between your sale events um, to, to keep your lifetime customer value and your repeat customer rate high. So that's why I don't do subscription. Now, loyalty is similar. I think loyalty programs are a really wonderful idea, again, for Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, even Gen Y which is basically anyone under 45. Over 45, you don't have a lot of tech savvy people. They didn't grow up with the internet. They're not used to technology in the same way that you take for granted your 
ability to interface with tech, to understand a loyalty program, to you know post it on your social media channels, to email it to friends. It's just not the same. So I've used things like FriendBuy, Talkable, um, you know, Smile.io, and my audience does not. And yeah, I've got good marketing. I understand how to let someone know about a program that I am running. I really do. And my audience just doesn't really adopt it, right? They're just, it's like I spend more on the service than I make back in the referrals. So for me, it's really about the audience that I am serving with Boom that is why I don't offer those things. I believe in subscription. Listen, Smart Marketer, the brand you're engaging with now, I've got a subscription called Team Traffic. And it's a monthly education program, continuing education for media buyers. If you're a media buyer, you buy traffic for a brand, there's no better ongoing training than that. It is the best thing in the market. It's an amazing program. Facebook group, videos, ad sumer reports. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And it's a subscription program. I have Blue Ribbon Mastermind subscription program. If you're a seven, eight or nine figure e-commerce business owner and you want to network and get together with and learn from and support and engage with other people who are, you know, walking that same path, there's no better group and it's a subscription. For Zipify apps, the whole business is subscription. For Smart Marketer and Zipify, we are launching loyalty rewards programs. So I believe in those marketing channels, but those businesses, Smart Marketer and Zipify, are interfacing with Gen X and below, right? 45 and under. That's mostly who I interface with as my customers, and therefore those marketing uh, you know, strategies work. Next question, Big J Jensen, alliterative J Jensen, says, as I sell t-shirts, what problems can I create content around? What problems that I, can I solve to create content around? So he's alluding to this idea that you need to create content that's related to the problem that your product solves. I teach that idea. I teach the idea that you know the content that you put out as a brand should be related to the problems that your products are solving. So like for example, I sell cosmetics to women over 50, so I create content like five makeup tips for women over 50 or you know how to put on, how to do your entire makeup routine in 10 minutes because I know that the problems that they have or that you know there's nobody who's got products specifically for them or that they want their cosmetic routine to be faster, etc. Well, the, the way that you learn what content to create is you understand the motivation of your purchaser, of your prospect. What is motivating that person in the first place to buy? The beautiful thing about apparel is that it's the biggest category out there. The most money to be made is in the apparel, apparel category. The problem with apparel is that you have to carry all these SKUs and things are constantly going out of season and all this other kind of stuff. But if you're selling t-shirts, you got to understand the motivation behind an apparel buyer. And for the most part, the motivation behind apparel buyers is community and appearance. Here's what I mean by that. Appearance is a lot of people who buy apparel are buying it because they want to look cool. They want the latest trends. They want to look like their favorite influencers, celebrities, brand ambassadors, etc. They want to look like Kanye or The Rock or whoever, right? So one of it is to look cool, but another thing is to uh, belong to communities. I buy jujitsu clothing. There's a, a jujitsu athlete named Edwin Najmi. He's a monster. He's Darson the world. He's awesome. And he is a brand ambassador for a company called Storm Kimonos. And they did a sweater that has a lightning bolt on the front and the back. Double turbo, like far more turbo than any clothes I ever wear. But number one, I like Edwin Najmi's jujitsu game. Number two, I want to look like Edwin Najmi looks in that sweatshirt, right? I want to belong to the community. I want to have that look. And so I saw that and I was like, man, that's super cool. I like this guy. I like his game. I like what he stands for and I'm going to buy his product. So I am buying that because my jujitsu friends will see that and, and, and recognize the brand and we can have a conversation about it. So it's about belonging to a community. And now the next question in that's a good question. All right, this question comes in from an Amazon seller. I'm gonna read it to you. Coming in from Priya Pandi on Instagram. Hey, hope you're well. I listened to your Helium 10 podcast, which was super interesting. Thank you. For someone starting out in e-commerce, would it be best to start with Amazon? First of all, thanks so much for listening to my podcast on Helium 10, really wonderful Amazon sellers. Um, super fun episode. I talked about Sumo. I talked about all kinds of fun stuff. And yeah, you know, I think if you're getting started in your business now in e-commerce, there's no better way to start than on Amazon. Here's why. Amazon is both the shopping cart and the traffic source. If you're starting with your own site on Shopify, you have to build out the shopping cart. You have to build all the pages, the product pages, the Google Analytics, the Facebook pixels, the email marketing, the website, and then you got to go and get traffic to drive to that website. You got to go 
create ads, buy ads. Now, I think that's a better business model in the long run because one of the things about Amazon is you do not own the asset of the customer. Like for example, if someone comes and buys from you on Amazon, that's Amazon's customer. You don't get the email address. You don't get to ship them things. That's not your customer. It's Amazon's customer. <laughs> that's really good. So on Amazon, you don't get the customer asset, but you get the shopping cart built for you. You don't really have to do anything but set up a product listing and some shipping settings. And you get the traffic source, which is all of Amazon's traffic built in. And 50 cents out of every dollar spent online in America is spent on Amazon. So all the traffic is already there. So all you gotta do is optimize your listing, do a few little product uh, giveaway type deals to get some reviews, run some Amazon sponsored ads, and you're gonna get sales going. It's much easier to launch on Amazon and get sales than it is to launch your own store and run ads and get sales. And so while Amazon is only cash flow, like you can't really think of it as, as an asset because with Amazon, you're building your house on someone else's land. Amazon can come in and backdoor you. If you start doing well, they'll go to your supplier, try to make the product themselves and put it out as Amazon product, right? They're gonna try to backdoor you to your supplier as you get successful. It happened to me several times on Amazon. Luckily, I was my own supplier because I was manufacturing. And so I would not sell to Amazon, but they tried that. People can negatively review you. They can attack your listing. People can hijack your listing. People can do all kinds of intense stuff to uh, make it harder for you. And when you are successful, that's just cash flow in as much as yes, you can sell your Amazon listing and the sales it is getting, but the multiple you will receive when you're selling a business, you sell it for a multiple of the yearly profit or a multiple of the yearly revenue. The multiple you receive for an Amazon business is between a one and three of the profit generally, because it's just not as valuable as if you were to build your own website and run your own ads to your own store to sell your product. At that point, you're in control of the advertising, any assets that are generated, you know, pixeled audiences, email lists, customer databases, you own those. It's much, much better and it's a much more valuable asset and it's worth doing. But to start, launch on Amazon, do private label, so you're you know, private labeling someone else's product. You're someone, you, know, you go to the farmer's market, someone's making a screen, skin cream, you say, hey, I'd love to sell your skin cream on the internet. Can I put my own label on it, create my own brand around it? You create the product for me. I'll put it on Amazon. I'll do all the marketing for it. So you're building your own brand with your own brand value, right? Don't drop ship, private label, or manufacture your own product if you got a little bit more money. Put it on Amazon, build out your listing, get some reviews going, get some Amazon sponsored search ads going, get it ranking, get it, make it some sales. And then any money that you make, take that and invest it in running ads to your own website. So start on Amazon, then move to your own website. The next question is actually more of a comment and I'm going to hide this person's name because I don't want them to get flamed online. I'm actually going to look down at my computer and read this question. You'll actually see it right up here next to me, but I'm going to read it so that I can then respond. Ezra, Ezra's, so apparently there's two of me, I guess, I don't know. I, I didn't see that the first time I read it. Ezra's, you are totally at the top of your game. Thank you, sir. I'm trying, you know, I'm really trying. I question the foul language as it makes you look bad. For the record, I said bullshit in a past video. I said, that is bullshit. And I was talking about a players. I was saying that this idea that there's an A player and a B player is bullshit. There are only players and then how much support, resource, motivation, you know, how much they receive, how well they are educated, how well they are held accountable, how much you take care of them and invest in them. That's what there is. You can create an A player was my point. So anyways, I said the word bullshit, which this person took offense to. Let's read the rest of the question. I think you offended the lady in the video. No. I did not offend the lady in the video. She's my COO. She uses that word more than I do. We don't necessarily always use it on video. We're not coming out. Look, I understand some people find profanity offensive. And one of the things that we are specifically doing is designing our content such that it's going to be palatable for all audiences, right? I'm not swearing all the time. I'm not swearing in every video. There are some influencers that that's part of their whole game. That's what they do. They're constantly swearing and cursing. And I think, frankly, that's okay. I think express yourself and use whatever words you want to use to get your point across that you think will resonate with your audience. I use them to make points, right? Like I swear quite a bit, actually, you know, in my da daily dialogue, not as much as some people, but I definitely include swearing in my uh, dialogue. Like I, I grew up 
swearing as a kid and as an, a young adult, it was not necessarily looked down upon in the community where I was raised. And then I used it. And so I still use curse words, but, but specifically in my video content, I understand that there's a large part of my audience who finds that some level of offensive. And I'm interested in having my content be super palatable and really resonate with all my viewers. So I use my curse words to make points, right? When I think something is bullshit, I'm going to tell you, I think it's bullshit. I'm not just going to swear all crazy because I, I think that actually I can make my point more effectively with using words that describe what I'm trying to have come across, which not are not always curse words, right? But sometimes there's room for that. Let me read the rest of the question. Uh, you know, I think the lady, I think you offended the lady in the video. Don't lower yourself, be professional. Hey, in the words of the Big Lebowski, that's just like your opinion, man. Jesus. You know, you have the opinion that cursing lowers you, is not professional, is offensive to women in this case, which, to some people, sure it is, but to, a, but to the, the larger portion of my population who are watching my videos, maybe don't want me cussing at them all the time, but the occasional curse word when it, when it needs to be said about something that is bullshit, you gotta, you gotta have room for that. And frankly, you know, what I find is that many folks, the ones who are attempting to comment and give me negative feedback, are also including censorship. They want to censor me in some way. They want to censor how I look. They want me to take down my man bun. They want me to censor how I talk. And I'm not, this is the internet. This is live from the internet. If you want to censor something, go censor it on cable television where they're going to allow you to censor shit. You're not, I'm not going to go for censorship, right? I'm going to take a look at my audience, look at the, the goal that I have in mind, which is in this case to inspire people, to help them, to show them how I'm doing things, to motivate them to do better in their life and business, to like add value to their life. And if your response to that is to attempt to censor me because you don't find what I am doing to be valuable to you, then look, man, you're not my mark. You're not my customer. You're not somebody who's going to enjoy my show. My shows mostly don't have curse words in them. Sometimes they do, and I'm not going to stop doing that. And so I respect that you um, opened with, hey, man, you're at the top of your game. Like the way that you did this was actually very cool, right? You said you were expressing your viewpoint, which I'm open to. I'm open to the feedback. I don't want you to not tell me what you think. In fact, I care so much about what you think that I'm responding to this publicly. I want you viewers to give me feedback, to tell me how I can make my content better, how I can make my courses better, how I can make the experience that you have engaging with me more fun, more pleasurable, more um, valuable to your life, right? I'm into that. So I'm looking for feedback. And sometimes I'm not going to take the feedback like in this case. Uh, but I think that the way that you went about it was actually cool. You said, hey, Ezra's, <laughs> two of me, you're totally on top of your game. I question the foul language as it makes you look bad. I think you offended the lady in the video. Don't lower yourself, be professional. So that's your opinion that, you know, uh, the way that you've approached this, super respect, was not mean-spirited, was not angry, was just like, hey, dude, you don't realize that the shit that you're doing is offending people and you could do better was your, was your viewpoint and your communication to me was that maybe I didn't understand or didn't realize the effect I was having on my audience and you were trying to hit me to that. And I think that that was actually a really nice thing to do, a really loving thing to do. And just for the record, I did understand the communication I was making and the effect it might have on some audience members. And I still felt it was appropriate. So I will continue to swear here and there where it makes sense. And uh, thank you for the feedback. And, you know, I'm interested. I actually might, this might totally backfire on me, but I'm interested. Do you think it's okay to swear in videos or are you against profanity on all levels and you think it lowers you, it makes you look unprofessional. It's, it's, uh, um, you know, I don't, I don't actually know the, I think the criticism against profanity is that uh, it's not spreading a positive message or it's not, um, uh, you know, that you could use better words to get your point across, which in this case, I actually don't think I could have. I think I'd get my point across exactly what I wanted to communicate was that word. Um, or maybe, you know, I don't know, it's bad for children or something. I'm not, maybe, you know, those of you who are on the never swear train, Give me the feedback of why you should never swear. And those of you that don't care or are not offended by it, endorse this message and tell me that you're not offended by it or that, you know, or why you don't think it's offensive and you think it's cool or it's cool to do here and there, or you wouldn't want, you know, that the amount of it that I'm doing is the right amount. I'm actually interested. So let's, let's have a dialogue here about whether or not it's okay to swear in videos and that'll do it for this week's episode or this season's episode. We don't do this every week. Uh, that's a good question.
Thanks for your questions. I would love, I would love to answer more questions for you about business, about life, about community, about relationships, about jujitsu, about anything that you want to ask me about advertising, video making, whatever, anything you're interested in. I very much enjoy the opportunity to engage directly with my fans, my followers, folks who are getting value out of this, answer any questions you might have. I can't get to all of them, but I would love just post under this video, any question you have and even better, even better shoot a video on your iPhone. Um, and look at the camera and say, you know, what's up as, uh, love the show. If you don't love the show, don't say that. I have this question for you. And then I will play that video on this segment. I'll play the video and then I'll respond to you. It's way better, way more dynamic, way more interactive. I get to see you. I get to hear from you. I get a sense of who you are. So shoot me a video, email it to Ezra, E-Z-R-A at smartmarketer.com. I'll put that on the screen here. Send the email. Ezra at smartmarketer.com with the subject line, that's a good question, and I will, I will respond to all the video. If you send a video in, I'm gonna respond to you. The, the folks who are just typing, I want you to, if, if it's easier for you to just type your question underneath this video, that works too. I'll take it, but I may not get to all those. The people who send in videos, I'm gonna get to those. So send me a video. Uh, say what's going on, how you doing, tell me what you like about the show, how you doing, uh, in, in joke from when I used to be Johnny, how you doing? Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to get your questions and use them here on this segment called, that's a good question. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next episode. And that's it for this episode of Live from the Internet. Thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in having me review your brand, if you've got an e-commerce brand and you think it would be a great fit for buying stuff and talking about it, which is a really fun segment for e-commerce brand owners, send me an email to Ezra at smartmarketer.com. Put in the subject line, buying stuff and talking about it, and then describe your brand, put in a link to your social media profiles, put in a link to your website. We will review those and we'll take submissions and then we'll buy your stuff and we'll talk about it. So, so send us that if you're interested in us reviewing you for buying stuff and talking about it. And let me know anything else you'd like to see in this show. Is there segments that I'm missing? Is there something you'd like me to cover? If you have questions, shoot a video, like I said, and send them in. Uh, it's been a really lovely, wonderful time. I love doing this show. I love the opportunity to engage with you, to talk to you about business, to talk to you about life. Hope you've gotten some value for this I, from this. I understand that the most valuable thing that you have is your time. I really do. I get it. And when you choose to spend some of that time with me, I'm going to do everything that I can to make it valuable for you, to make it entertaining for you, to make it worth your while. So thank you so much for spending some time with me on Live from the Internet. I'm going to go out with this clip right here. I'll leave you with it. Thanks for watching.